Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch and enjoyed the morning session. Thank you all for joining us today for the 25th annual NJDOT Research Showcase. Uh, my name is Ryan Stesey. I'll be your moderator for this uh, safety breakout session. I work at Rutgers Kate. Uh, we have three presentations for you today, um, about 25 minutes each, and then we'll have time for questions and answers uh, in between each session. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Mr. Deep Patel, who's our first speaker today. Deep Patel, I hope you're presenting on uh, determining key factors linked to injury severity in intersection related crashes in New Jersey. Mr. Deep Patel is a PhD student in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rowan University, where he's working as a research fellow and a teaching assistant, and is also currently engaged on several fun federally funded projects to enhance the mobility and safety of our transportation systems. Additionally, Deep has uh, several published papers in prestigious journals and conference proceedings and has been selected as a recipient of several nationally recognized awards, including the ITS New Jersey Outstanding Graduate Student Award, the Future of ITS NJ Award, and the Lifesavers Traffics Safety Scholar Award, among many more. So with that, uh, Deep, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone. So, uh, uh, thank you, Ryan, for the introduction. So, uh, I'll, today I'll try to talk about determining the key factors affecting the injury severity in the intersection-related crashes in New Jersey, specifically. And uh, this was a work uh, conducted by me, one of my uh, colleagues, Rukaya, and uh, our professor, Dr. Muhammad Jalayar. Uh, today I'll try to talk about some of the introduction research objective uh, some of the literature review that we conducted uh, associated with the topic and data collection part, methodology, results, and conclusion, and going over to the recommendations that could be potentially be used from the outcomes what we saw out of it. So as we all know, right, so according to the FSWA, it has been uh, analyzed and it has been seen that 50% of the combined fatal and injury crashes occur at or near the intersection area, like in the, within the intersection boundaries, right? And specifically, if we look over to the New Jersey's uh, data, uh, we have seen that there has been a 39% increase in the fatal injuries uh, since 2015 and looking over 2019 data and follow up uh, once we get the final data for 2022, 2023, even the numbers looks high. So but once it is finalized by the NJDHTS and the NJDOT Safety Voyager, those data also would be like a higher in terms of the proportion with the previous years. Looking over to this, uh, we try to first try to analyze it, like is it just the fatal which is increasing overall crashes or is it something else? And we observed that since 2015, 16, 17, 18, and 19, we have seen a gradual, gradual increase in the proportion of fatal and serious injuries for, like compared to the overall crashes, if we see the proportion. And every year we have been seeing this increase over there. And we have been he hearing about a lot of news about intersections, like New Jersey being the most dangerous, New Jersey has the most dangerous intersection, driving behaviors of our, like New Jersey at, this is deadliest intersections. All of those kind of news have been published, which raises concerns day by day for the people of New Jersey and who we live in the New Jersey and to explore what are the reasons behind of increasing of this injury severity. Crashes are going down. The numbers of the frequency of the crashes are going down, but why the fatal and the serious injuries are increasing over the time period. Looking over to this thing, uh, we try to define two of our major uh, objectives is to find the significant com uh, contributing factors related to the injury severity and trying to associate, uh, associate the recommendations uh, for the professionals and the policymakers that can be adopted for modifications for their in the future aspect, right? And this all findings, we try to do it based on like implementing some of the machine learning uh, models and some uh, advanced modeling uh, aspects, which is related to identifying the contributing factors with specific uh, uh, adaptive of every independent variables or the, all the associated variables due to the cash crashes that are happening. So to look over to this one, we looked over to like uh, 32 studies as a final output of it, which were connected with our research work, wherein we try to first look over to 400 uh, like 
of papers which were looking into the intersection related crashes where we got an idea that okay what they are looking into it is it the frequency base it is the base on the geometrical implementation before and after studies all those kind of studies were looked over it then specifically looking into the objective we digged into a specific papers which talked about the injury severity aspect and then uh, as a part of the advance as we have we are been going over the data and then expanding huge data sets over the period we looked into the machine learning algorithms that can be employed and deployed towards identifying and predicting basically the injury severities uh, that can be caused due to several different types of uh, reasons of like let's say during the daytime driving on uh, at a speed of such and such what could be the potential of having a uh, severity of the crash and those stuff, right? So machine learning models can help us out. And out of which specifically, we fo uh, we focused only on the papers which were recently published in the last uh, 10 years, like basically from 2011 to 2021. And then we try to object it out to the recent ones because we want to also get the recommendations which are the new ones, not towards to the old ones, which may be like, uh, have already been adopted over the years, right? So we want to eliminate that part too. Uh, uh, looking over to the uh, review, in terms of the factors impacting intersection crash severity, the majority of the papers showcased us is the weather condition. Some of the pa papers have shown us in the clear weather, and that can be highly dependent on which region, which location they are working on, and majority of them have showed also us with the adverse weather condition also in the same time. So when we see this part, uh, it might differ on it. Uh, lightning condition, driver's age, vehicle type, and traffic control. This were the five of the major ones which we have observed from all the papers uh, that we reviewed and associated with to this uh, factors only. And if we look over to the machine learning crash analysis mo uh, modeling part, majority of the papers have adopted like XGBoost and uh, light GMB models because they are faster to compute even with uh, less uh, less data or less sample size with the high accuracy part. Uh, and this was the something outcome that we saw. But even though when they did this part, the research gap still identifies this part that modern machine learning techniques are needed because sometimes the machine learning models might go into the biased decisions of making because of the tree classifiers that have been justified by the analytics guy, right? The statistical guy who is trying to uh, uh, distribute the uh, factors, try to annotate the data, that can be biasness can be observed. So what are the modern machine learning techniques that can be adopted to avoid those kind of limitations to the data side or towards the biasness side? And then other advanced method that can help us to identify contributing factors by evaluating each of them as an equal entity of all variables. So looking over to this thing, like, right, uh, we were looking at the previously has been observed, like odd, odd ratio, significancy testings, all of those helped us out to find out the, the contributing factors. But for those ones, we had to eliminate out certain variables. We could only test it for like, okay, high speed, this is what's happening. This part, uh, let, let's for the situation of a nighttime condition, this is happening. But how about uh, combining seven or eight different situations together to come up with a better contributing aspect, right? So that imbalancing is still a gap which needs to be covered up. Looking over to this thing, uh, we try to use the five years of the data uh, since from 2015 to 2019 for the New Jersey, uh, wherein we try to apply the filters for the data only for the crashes that happen within the boundaries of the intersection. Uh, and wherein we found out our final data set to be having nearly 200, uh, 234,192 uh, crash records, which included 2,180 fatal and serious injuries, uh, and then uh, 70,000 uh, possible and minor injuries, and nearly 160,000 uh, non apparent or like, a, like a, just an object based injuries, which did not injure uh, the part of it. Uh, wherein uh, the variables that we had uh, analyzed and filtered out to be a good quality data were temporal variable, wherein season, day of the week, crash hours were considered. Uh, for the roadway features, we used the road system, area, uh, uh, highway type, median type, posted speed. Uh, and then for the environmental, we considered weather, lightning condition, surface condition. Then for the crash characteristics, we used uh, several other uh, variables, which are like crash type, environment of alcohol, curb, head-on collision, pedestrian involved, unsafe speed, bicycle is involved, distracted driving, all those variables which are available on the crash data, they were being considered uh, 
And then the last one was the intersection characteristics. This were the characteristics that were extracted out from the summaries of the crash records which were provided uh, on the database. So was the traffic signal present, stop sign present at those intersections? So we don't have that specific data being uh, alerted on the data set itself, but we have the crash, uh, like the summary reports, which tries to help us out giving information about it. And based on those uh, uh, summary, we extracted out uh, the intersection characteristics uh, part two. Uh, let's go over to the methodological part. So over here, I'll just try to go very brief on to the names because this machine learning models are like heavily technical, but they do the same process because they are mostly the tree-based classifiers, which try to classify from the trees and try to make a decision how and what are the impacting parts towards the decision making of uh, the injury severity. Like that's our dependent variable over here. So what it is leading towards it, right? So all of these uh, models were uh, tested out because these are the new ongoing models which are uh, highly used for the categorical database. So we use CatBoost, XGBoost, uh, Light GMBs, and then Random Forest. However, as there is a gap being even seen that there is a missing part for the more modern ones, right? So what we did is this, we came up with an assemble model, which tries to combine out all the four outcomes, balance out the data of the four prediction models together, which is considered as an assemble model, and come up with a higher potential to predict for a lower prediction rate uh, of injuries. Like let's say we have fatal and serious injuries to be a very lower sample size that can be balanced out if we try to calibrate the, all the four models in, uh, together with the equivalency of the weighted system too. And then for the, contribu uh, the contributing factors, we use the shapely adaptive explanation values, which tries to equally give a distribution to all the uh, variables and then I, uh, tries to score all of them together and then come up with a significant one for a specific injury that has been defined for the prediction. And as a part of the machine learning side, the major part for the data preparation goes into like data cleaning, data transformation, like, like let's say we don't have defined categories, we need to annotate them from point one and provide them a specific annotations as okay, if it is involved or not involved. And then if it's say, let's say we have seven different types of categories, we need to recategorize them based on different, different aspects, right? So those all stuff comes into the part of the data preparation side of it. And then even to test if the data is valid or not, does it goes into non-essential or I would say other databases like unknown data, right? So we need to remove those ones. Like let's say if there is a whole variable which has a lot of unknowns, which is like majority of the times when we are talking about street names or Latin longitudes, those are the variables which tries to be dropped off because there are a lot of missing values which are not available on certain of the stuff. And or the new parameters, let's say in 2018 and 19, the the agency decided to add up a parameter, but those parameters were not there in before for 2015, 16, and 17. So not to consider those ones. So all this kind of part is done to have the relevancy of the analysis, to have a balanced approach rather than a uh, biased approach saying that like 2018 and 19 had a parameter of having drowsy, dri drowsy driving involved, but before that was not there. So then it would imbalance out the whole data, right? So that kind of approaches were uh, adapted to remove those aspects too. It's just an example. So drowsy driving was since 2015, it's available, but it's just an example I was trying to give it out. And to understand uh, how the model is performing, is it correct, not, what are the accuracies? So we did our basic testing part, which is accuracy, recall, precision, and F1 scores, which is highly classified from the confusion metrics, which is like, where does the prediction model predicts after getting, getting the training data set? Does it predict the positive, true positive, false negative, or false positive, true negative, what it is predicting, right? Like, is it saying that it was a fatal and the prediction model says it was a fatal, it goes into true positive. But let's say if a model says it was not a fatal crash and the predicting says it's a fatal crash. So that's how it is distributed all over the, the confusion matrix that how it is making the decision. And then based on that, the accuracies and the recall and precision values are being evaluated. And this is the overall flowchart, like uh, how the process of this uh, modeling purpose went through. We used the crash data, did the pre-processing part. Then the data is split into 80 to 20%, wherein there is a training data set, which is 
where the models are trained to make the predictions. And then there is a 20% data which is separated out to make the predictions out of it. And then once their uh, models are being evaluated with those accuracy, accuracy testing and all of those, there are uh, the contributing factors using the shapely values being identified wherein first we tried to identify the top 10 variables based on all the attributes at attributes that we had given to the model to uh, figure out and then based on that top, top 10 attributes we tried to first uh, for the the top one was like the first one was the crash type which is highly impacting towards the crashes severity level uh, and the second one was the traffic control system because it's intersection related, which has been mostly looked over into the parts of literature and everywhere being considered of it. So we try to see both of them into details for each and every situation. Let's say for an angle crash, for a rear end crash or for a side sweeps crash, what are the other factors which are being considered as an impacting part? Like if we normalize the data and consider only for like uh, angle related crashes what is happening or let's say if it is a traffic signal like at the places where traffic signal is present what are the factors which are being impacted or what are it's affecting so those kind of stuff was looked into in to get a detailed aspect of it as a part of the model performance uh, as it is a tree classifier um, like the first three got a nearly similar accuracies that were being observed which was nearly like 73 percent and there were disparences, seventy-three point zero one zero seven eight or nine, but like just nailing down to the last two digits, it's like most of them got seventy-three. And when we combined those models all together, we were able to achieve a higher accuracy and better uh, precision score for the overall analysis, which showcased that uh, ensemble models like can be dev uh, can be used for having a higher prediction accuracy plus getting the actual values in terms of the prediction based on the data sets that we are having uh, to get into the in depth of the accuracy analysis and all of that part uh, this is the confusion matrix that can help us out to understand that how and what they are predicting so looking over to one of this aspect is xg boost right uh, for that from the test data set it tries to predict saying that okay how many were fatal crashes right like fatal injury or the incap uh, capacitating injuries right and how much it is predicting if this both values matches out it's the 19 that you see number so this is a very smaller value because you, when we are giving like we are only giving 2000 data sets point uh, for the training module to understand and out of that it has to do the prediction which is lower but let's see for the uh, possible injuries we are giving a really high data set then again the po uh, the positive outcomes for the possible injuries is higher so it's like you give more data you get more output right but it doesn't happen on all of them like each model works differently in terms of the classifiers of their own trees and nodules being defined and each of them has their uh, epoxy rates which tries to make the uh, the best closest prediction model the same way when we go to the uh, random forest, uh, it is not able to predict the fatal or in, uh, incapacitary injury as equivalent to the fate uh, XG boost is able to do it. And then if we see towards the light GMB, it's even uh, performing worse. But if we, if we look over to the other aspects for the, the possible injuries or non-incapacitating injuries, they are predicting really high. So this showcases that it is highly dependent on to the the data that we are holding and how much imbalances that we are performing on it right so once we did the ensemble model of like combining those models we are able to see an increase in the prediction side for the fatal and incapacitating injury whereas also an increase in uh, accurately predicting the non -in like all the three aspects have increased significantly which increases your um, overall accuracy percentage to the 74 versus the 73 which was observed or 70 which was observed for the other four uh, models now looking over to the shapely part of it which helps us to identify the major contributing factors from all over the attributes that we are having that can help us to understand that what are the impacting factors what are impacting towards the prediction of the model on the roadways right so let's say crash type right crash type is one of the major ones that we are seeing over here because uh, so this graph goes this way it tries to uh, first uh, use a hierarchy model the values which are highly impacting would be ranked one and then move on was to second third and fourth towards the prediction of the fatal or serious injuries okay so this is only for the prediction of fatal or serious injuries uh, so when it is predicting that part the crash type is the highest one impacting uh, posted speed limit is the second one 
and uh, how to see it what postage speed limit the postage speed limit has several categories right we cannot say just only uh, 10 miles 25 miles 35 miles right so it has several categories you can see a different variation in the color some of them you might see purple uh, so low value means uh, low is like it, it has been encoded into categorical values from one two three four five where the low is one and the five is the highest so one is uh, zero to 25 then two is 25 to 35 three is 35 to 45 and then fourth one is like that's where, like how the distribution of the categories have been done for those part so we can see over here the higher the speed we can see the red part going over here into the positive direction of uh, the shape value which showcases very well that if the uh, the speed is increasing the chances of having a fatal or severe injuries are also increasing on the side by side basis whereas let, let's let, let's we say about the pedestrian involvement we can also see then a zero over here the lower one is the value is like no and the uh, higher value number two is uh, yes the, is the pedestrian involved yes or pedestrian or no we can see a wider range of distribution which showcases that this is affecting but there are different various aspects which are being involved other than also being having a pedestrian involved lightening condition and all of those so how it is influencing that if it is into a clustered position and creating a mountain shape then it is saying it is significantly this is the factor which is affecting whereas if it is distributed in a wider range it showcases it is one of the part of it but there are other several other variables which are connected to it which can be uh, identified later on I think that this can be a correlation towards having a pedestrian involvement at the intersection leading towards the injury severity to be fatal or not. Uh, moving further, as I mentioned, if it is widely distributed, uh, how to find it out, like what it is happening, right? So let's say about crash type as it is one of the top most, right? So when the crash type was equivalent to angle, what is happening over here? When the crash type was equal to rear end, when the crash type was equal to side swipe, when the crash type was equal to fixed object, right? Those are the categories that have been uh, provided by the data sets specifically. And then once we dig in, we get to know how this each of them, when we say like only for the crash, angle related crash crashes, what are the factors which are modifying? We see posted speed limit, uh, motorcycle is involved, run of the road involved. And then if we see for the rear end crashes, the season, Basically, it's the fall, summer, spring. It's a temporal, a temporal variable. What is the most of the impacting part for rare end crashes? And a side swipe also is one of them. And then moving further, we have the other one is the fixed object too. And then this is for the traffic control system specifically. Like when we say that presence of traffic signals, what are the major ones uh, that are impacting towards the uh, contributing towards the injury severity to be fatal or serious, right? So the crash type posted speed limit is for the stop sign ones. Then uh, uh, presence of the yield sign is highly dependent on the visibility side of the seasonal thing. And then the lane marking part, right? So overall, this was the conclusion that we observed is this from this whole work is this ensemble models achieve the highest accuracy uh, de demonstrating an effectiveness in pre uh, predicting the crash severity accuracy and then from the shapely we were able to identify that angle crash type higher speed lim uh, higher, higher speed limits and temporal variable like summer and fall duration and then the time of the day between uh, uh, like 12 to 6 in the afternoon period uh, is increasing the severity of the injury for the intersection related crashes and this finding can be helpful for uh, valuable guidelines for the uh, 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 transportation safety professionals and those ones. And based on this, we try to come up with a recommendation aligning with some of the papers and with the FHWA part. For the crash type, the recommendation that are usually used when it is an angle crash type is increasing or contributing higher, dedicated left, uh, left or right uh, lanes at intersection, providing offsets of left or right turning lanes, you you reducing the left, uh, uh, left turn conflicts by restricting uh, crossing of U-turns or certain stuff and using high contrasting markings for payment uh, like payment markings for the turning lanes can be one a uh, few of the recommendations that can be used and then if we look over to the higher speed limit uh, implementations of roundabout oversized advanced intersection warning signs or retro reflective uh, sh uh, sh uh, shittings on uh, speed limit uh, signs or providing yellow change intervals, right? That's what we saw from our plenary session, one of them presented that they did this part of the modifications on those intersections too. 
and other than this part like some generalized uh, parts that we observed were like targeted inform enforcements which can be specifically for the temporal temporal side like during those months or during those hours if the enforcement is increased that can also help about like for the uh, for the drivers to be more attentive and those kind of stuff and then reduce the crashes of it and then some of them is the educational side of it trying to teach the older drivers or to be less distracted. Those kind of stuff could be one of the educational initiatives that can be ta taken to help them out, right? And then some of the recommendations towards the modeling side of the AI or certain stuff, having more advanced models, like Ensemble models right now, we only integrated three or four together. There are like more than 20, 25 uh, machine learning models which can be categorized in a different, different ways with uh, numerical base, uh, categorical base, all of those can be synthesized together to come up with a better ensemble models, not only directing to a tree based classifier or certain ones and having an enhanced data collection uh, where we can have more about the information. Right now, we don't hold all of those information on the crash data uh, databases, like every cycle time of a traffic light, uh, lane specific location information we don't have, real time vehicle speed we do not have uh, before the time of the crash, right? This all stuff can be added up uh, using the new technologies, which can help out to enhance and dig into that uh, kind of like contributing factors that we can look over it. And then the last one is like uh, continuously monitoring behavioral changes and conflict analysis, near miss analysis. Those all like constant monitoring can be adopted that can help us out to uh, work on it, to modify and have a better results and better data basically. And thank you everyone. Uh, providing the best one, like in terms of the hierarchical side, it's very difficult to justify because each location will have a different kind of a different criteria. But coming over to the generalist side, uh, we try to use the previous literature, previous recommendation before and after studies or the factors of the modification factors of development uh, documentation. And then the th uh, fourth one, we use the FHWA's countermeasure guideline uh, book where they provide it. Like you can make an adjustment saying that if it is this kind of crash type, if it is this kind of ADD over here, what are the pot uh, potential recommendations that sh you should be implementing for the modification side of it? So it's a multiple uh, approach uh, where we try to synthesize and come up with like some uh, some of the recommendations from the papers end and some of them towards the uh, part of the FHW's uh, uh, countermeasure recommendation tool. Basically, it's a mixed approach. Okay. So basically from the data, we try to identify what are the major contributing factors we are having, right? So we saw that crash, uh, like angle crash type at intersection is one of the major factors which in leads towards the increasing in the injury severity. Now based on that angle crash type, we tried to look into it uh, with the different papers. Let, let's say uh, there were certain papers which we did the frequency analysis, but they did not provide a proper recommendation because their recommendations were highly towards getting those frequencies, not to the injury side. So those were eliminated out, but the ones which specifically focused on to the fatal or such kind of injuries that were only considered to provide the enlisted part of it. So there were filtration that were done where it, it's a summarized concept. And then another one was that we, as I mentioned, I adopted the FSWA's uh, countermeasure tool, which is the best one that can be helped out to draw your recommendations or conclusions for any of the problems that you are seeing. Some of them can be like, uh, it won't help us out to identify if there is a temporal, temporal kind of uh, like contributing factor, the FHW does not give on those ones. But like, let's say if it's geometrical, it's on the volumetric side, or it's on the rural or urban area side, they provide those kind of recommendation on those side, what could be adopted for the modification purposes.
yes, they did mention about the vehicle type too. Uh, but as a part of our limitations for the New Jersey database, we are not having those information. That's why it was not included on it. But yeah, uh, vehicle type was one of them, but not mentioned by every state. Like, let's say if I'm looking over to 32 states, right? Some of them are doing national database. Some of them are doing state database. Some of them are doing the local database from the city or the community side, whatever the crash data that they are holding. And from those aspects, they are trying to draw their conclusion out. So if the database is holding those stuff, some of them had it and some of them did not mention about those part because it's like for New Jersey, we don't have the vehicle type, some of them. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So that is a database that is available for the feds one. Uh, New Jersey one has a vehicle type, but it leans towards more towards the weight of the vehicle, like how much pounds it is. That's the kind of data for the New Jersey that's available for us. We don't have a type of it, but we can signify the type, but we cannot justify which make it was. Uh, yes, uh, win, but uh, uh, the police reported database does not provide the win to the public access. So if we have to request it out specifically to that part, definitely we get the win numbers. But as of right now, the database that is available publicly from the Voyager or this side, uh, uh, the N New Jersey Department of Highway Traffic Safety, uh, they both do not provide the win number on them. Are the universities having access to that one? That's the biggest question. Uh, I, I can check it yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, if it is so, then it's very helpful to us to yeah. get the make, model, all of the other details can be established on those side part of it. But yeah, definitely, that's the main thing that if we get this win information, then the whole vehicle type category can be reorganized to bring it down onto it. And the main thing is this, when we put down to vehicle type or the win details, we drop off nearly, we have seen this in the federal data, uh, national data, we saw that we drop off like nearly 60 to 70 percent of the data points because those values are missing on those ones. It's on the FARS, uh, CRSS, all of those websites, they hold the data where some of them has provided the VIN numbers, but when we filter out the data set, we are dropping off like now nearly to 60 to 70 percent of the data set because those informations are not provided on that, which is the biggest recommendation for any of the crash analysis side that a higher quality of data can definitely improvise towards getting a higher quality of uh, contributing factors. Thank you. All right, um, thank you again, Deep, for sharing your research with us. Our next presentation is going to be on understanding crash factors in dis disadvantaged communities, an examination of socioeconomic disparities and road safety. And this presentation is from Rukaya Alferis from Rowan University. She's a PhD student in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rowan, where she is working as a research assistant and is currently involved in several prestigious grants funded by the South Jersey Transportation Authority uh, New Jersey Division of Highway Traffic Safety and the New Jersey Department of Transportation to enhance mobility, safety, and main equ maintain equity across the transportation system. Rukaya has several published works and has been selected as a recipient of many award scholarships, such as the Future of ITS NJ Award, the Women's Transportation Philadelphia Vision for Equity Award, and the Comto General Scholarship Award, among many others. So with that, uh, Rukaya, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna start presenting a research that beside examining safety, it looks at it from the uh, lens of equity. The research is titled Understanding Crash Factors in Disadvantaged Communities and Examination of the Socioeconomic Disparities and Road Safety. 
Um, this research has been done by myself, Rukeya, my coworker, uh, Deep Patel, and my advisor, Dr. Muhammad Jalayer. To outline what I'm going to go through, this is the content. I'm going to start with an introduction, go through the research goals that we have for this research, um, walk through the study approach, um, briefly describe or talk about the literature review, uh, explain the data collection steps that included both the data collection for uh, disadvantaged communities and the crash data, discuss the analysis, the results that we got, and uh, finishing with a conclusion. To introduce the work, like we all know that traffic safety is a, a pressing concern in terms of the health factors or for, in terms of public health, which could affect like everyone, every individual in multiple uh, communities. And if we talk statistics, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration reported a significant spike traffic uh, fatalities in 2021. And this was pretty much alarming because it was the highest number since, 20, uh, si since 2005. And beside the public health concerns that we have uh, for the public's, for the traffic safety outcomes, economic burden is, is another alarming or another pressing uh, outcome from um, traffic safety results, which could include property dam damages lost in productivity for both people and drought networks, um, insurance uh, premiums, and also the, the medical expenses for traffic crashes. Now, if we look at these outcomes and how they are distributed on communities, um, are they fairly distributed? Which community is suffering more from these outcomes compared to another community? We see that traffic safety outcomes are not uniformly uh, distributed among the communities, and disadvantaged communities are seen to offer face dis dis um, <laughs> proportionate burden of traffic crashes and fatalities. And this is what we are pretty much examining in this research. We first defined our research goals, which starts with exploring the inequities in traffic safety and their outcomes in underserved communities. Uh, we also aimed to analyze the key contributing factors in traffic um, crashes in socially vulnerable areas or disadvantaged communities. Um, we also wanted to compare these factors between both the disadvantaged communities and the more stable or secure communities, or we simply can say not vulnerable communities. Lastly, we develop or we aim to develop an evidence-based recommendations to mitigate traffic safety disparities in socially vulnerable areas. To walk through the research and how we started it, we started with a literature review um, to see and understand what we have on hand in terms of traffic analysis and, and safety analysis. Uh, from that, we did see the, the SCAR number of research that does discuss the disparities of the safety um, outcomes between the vulnerable communities or that considers um, underserved communities in terms of um, traffic safety. So then we moved to the data collection, which included two data elements. The first one is um, the data that we needed in order to identify our vulnerable communities. We used for that the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, which published from the CDC. And it's a percentile rank that gives um, census tracts a rank from um, zero to one um, in order to give a vulnerability index for it. Uh, then we had our crash data, which um, we need to examine the factors for. Moving to the data analysis, we did or utilized a prediction model, the extreme gradient boosting known as XGBoost. Um, along with that, we used the Shapley additive explanations value in order to understand more how these factors or how the different contributing factors to the crashes affect or work in each of the communities or areas that we are looking at. Lastly, we reached our analysis results from which we concluded um, the work. In terms of the literature review, it's like very broad lens in terms of what we find in the literature once we dig into traffic safety and what we have once we try to see how traffic safety is examined in terms of vulnerable or underserved communities. Road geometry, traffic volumes, and um, human factors are, all, are majorly identified as contributing to crash events. Um, and they are the most examined ones among the literature. Um, However, once we look at the social demographic and economic um, outcome or aspects in, the, um, in terms of crash um, factors, we kind of see this rare in our um, literature and it's kind of neglected, neglected. However, after I would say 2021, we see some recent studies that 
considered the contributing factors to crashes in underserved communities, they are still very limited. And the, f the highlighted results from these researches were that disparities in the pedestrian and bicycle safety uh, were um, found in these researches. Um, and we all know that pedestrian and bicycles are vulnerable road users, which once we want to consider the equity aspects, they need speci special um, actions or recommendations. Starting with the data collection, the first data item that I just mentioned is the CDC Social Vulnerability, Vulnerability Index, known as the SVI. So this vulnerability index, it generates a percentile rank um, among all the census tracts for 15 selected variables. So if we look at the table, these variables are distributed for um, into four uh, different themes, starting with the socioeconomic uh, ones, household composition dis and disability, the minority status and language barrier, and lastly, the housing type and transportation. In, in a specific within each of these categories, for the socioeconomic ones, we, s we see that it includes um, people uh, below poverty level, the level of income, the educational level, and um, the unemployment rate. If we look at the housing composition, we see that it looked at the percentage or the presence of older population, younger population who age less than um, 17 years old, uh, the civilians with disability and the single parent households with children under 18 uh, years old. Looking at the minority, as defined in the book, minority was defined into this um, index as all people except white and non-Hispanic, in addition to people who speak um, less than well English and they age more than five years old. In terms of the housing type, housing and structure with more than t with a 10 or more units, uh, the mobile housing and people in group quarters, uh, occupied house housing units with more people than rooms, and of course, to consider transportation, they took households with no vehicles. So the percentile ranks starts from zero to one, and the greater the value goes, the more, the more vulnerable the census tract is. This is just a presentation in terms of the, uh, so, um, the geographical aspect for both um, the CDC's um, social vulnerability index in the whole of New Jersey, and how did we deal with it in order to perform our analysis? So the first map it exam it, um, splits out the, the ranking into four categories, zero to 0, to 0 0.25, 2.5 to half, and then half to 0 0.75, and lastly, the last categories. And the darker the color go goes, the more vulnerable the area is. Now, for us to examine the difference between the traffic factor, the traffic contribute or safety contributing factors in vulnerable communities versus the not vulnerable communities, we took the percentiles the highest and the lowest. So the lowest ones from zero to zero point one, um, which uh, uh, highlights the the good communities or the not vulnerable communities or more stable, and then the zero point nine to one, which highlights the communities or the census tracts that mostly vulnerable. We took this data on the side and then we started digging into the crash data to collect it. Uh, we did use the crash analysis tool provided by the New Jersey Division of Highway Safety. In order to get our data, we took the crash data from 2015 to 2019. It's a five year crash data. After filtering and cleaning the data, the final data set included 906,637 crash records, um, from which 7,275 were fatal injuries and suspected serious injuries, which the highest level of severity um, in terms of three categories. Now we have this data, we do have our census tracts, but we need the crash points that are located within our selected census tracts. To do that, we overlapped it using GIS and then um, the table represents our final data set in terms of our selected um, crash data based on the census tracts. So for the low uh, social vulnerab vulnerability index, which is the not vulnerable communities, we do have um, around seven, 50,000 crashes, approximately, um, splitting out into 583 fatal ones, um, around the similar number, of, number for the vulnerable areas, 582 um, crashes were fatal, um, and maybe approximately the same uh, sum up, around 70,000 crashes. This is the representation of the total uh, crashes in New Jersey. One of them is the heat map for overall crashes. 
And we see in the north area, the counties of Hudson, Essex Union, North, Middlesex, and South Bergen. We see like a big hotspot there. Um, in addition to the northwest area of Camden County, which Camden City is located there, and it's very well known as one of the most underserved communities in New Jersey. Um, and then on the other map, we see the fatal crashes, not the overall crashes. And then they have almost the same hot spots, some of them on the north side. And then we still see Camden City as one of the um, hot spots for the fatal <coughs> crashes as well. Now we took this data, we took the crash data that are located on our census tracts. We defined um, our variables in order to run um, the, the analysis. To run the analysis, we utilized XGBoost model, as I mentioned earlier, and the variables that we included in there, it includes temporal variables that covered seasons, winter versus summer, spring and fall. Week of the day, it has binary value, weekends versus weekdays. Uh, some roadway features, which included road system intersections, it was a binary as well, either in, um, around the intersection or not. The area, it was rural versus urban areas, median type, posted speed limit, and road um, division. Uh, crash characteristics, it's pretty much long, but it's um, mostly um, a binary val variable um, values, um, either exist, either a yes or no or value, except for the crash type uh, variable. Looking at the environmental conditions, we looked at the light conditions, weather, and surface condition. Um, this is the results of our prediction model, which is the XG boost. We run the model for both of the data sets that we have, the low um, social vulnerability index crashes and the high one. Look, um, the accuracy that we got, as we see in the table below, um, it's almost the same. We got 78% um, for the, the data set in the lower so social vulnerability index communities and 76 for the higher ones. And then, um, the, the confusion matrix pretty much explains the difference between the predicted uh, labels and the actual labels for each of the severities. And what we predicted exactly there is the, the fatal um, crashes. As I mentioned in the methodology section, we used Chabley values. Deep did a good job explaining how we interpret this. It took a load of me. What I'm gonna focus here, rather than interpreting these uh, two, um, looking at the difference between the, the crashes or the contributing factors into fatal crashes between the vulnerable areas, which is on that um, graph, and the uh, not vulnerable areas or the more stable uh, census tracts, which is on this crash. On, we see the, the single vehicle crash um, um, variable, side swipe, rear end taking the top three, pedestrian involvement taking top three, top four and distracted driving taking the top five, um, sorry, the, the fifth most important uh, variable in the, in the vulnerable communities. We see the intersection as the eighth um, contributing factor or the eighth important contributing factors. It, it goes along until the uh, 20, um, 20th contributing factor or 20th important one. While if we look at the um, better communities or the communities that are not vulnerable. Runoff uh, road crash has taken the top um, one uh, contributing factor. We see some of the um, crashes that are not on the vulnerable areas, such as the, the animal involvement. Um, older driver is one of the other factors that are not on the um, vulnerable areas. In addition to the heavy vehicle crashes, it's not there either. Um, even though we do have the pedestrian uh, crashes here, we have the bicyclist crashes as well. Um, and um, some, some factors are um, mutual between both the areas, such as the daylight, um, the winter weather, and then clear weather, the undivided roads, roads and um, the median type. To summarize the findings from the Shapely in terms of, of words, in socially vulnerable areas, we just saw that single vehicle crashes were the most contributing factor to increase crash severity in vulnerable areas, and also pedestrian involvement was the fourth most important variable, um, and the presence of it also increased the, the severity of the crashes. Um, several variables such as the crash type, angle um, crashes, the road uh, system of municipal, um, they both associated with lower crash severity levels in vulnerable uh, communities. And whereas in the list of vulnerable areas, which is 
the more stable areas, we saw runoff road crashes, rear end crashes, and side swipe crash types. Um, and the absence of, and also the involvement of animal crashes were the most significant factors contributing to lower crash um, severity. Now these findings and why uh, these factors is important as, and it could work as a very, um, as a substance input for decision makers and policymakers, also engineers, when they are trying to do systematic or systemic countermeasures in order to um, promote safety or make sure that the safety or the outcomes of safety um, issues is not, um, or it's like distributed fairly between the underserved communities and the more stable communities. And as a conclusion of this work, I can say that to address the disparities in traffic safety, some systematic interventions based on the findings and based on the factors that we define can create more equitable and safer transportation environments. Some of these um, um, interventions could include prioritizing infrastructure improvements, um, improving access to public transportation, which could reduce the single vehicle and the uh, pedestrian crashes, not always in terms of pedestrian promoting alternate, um, alternative modes of travel and developing traffic safety education programs and fostering collaboration among stakeholders. One uh, critical thing in terms of the communities, we should empower um, the residents uh, with their knowledge and skills and resources that are needed in order for them to have safer transportation choices and um, move around safely. This concludes my work for today. Thank you so much. I can take any questions. Thank you for um, the talk. Um, so I imagine that social vulnerability index is highly correlated with kind of the urbanicity of the of the built environment and the infrastructure. So how is it that you're um, taking that into account? Like when you look at the social vulnerability communities versus non, it could just be that it's the super urban versus the not so urban communities, which one of the clues to that was that the third most contributing variable in the in the stable communities is no live animal, which makes me think like that might be the more rural environment. So how are you kind of teasing out the co contributing, um, like the, the level of contribution from the urbanicity versus the social vulnerable index? So this is one of the limitations about us considering the underserved communities, just because by the time we did this research, we didn't have some of the data sets that provides or identify vulnerable communities in any other way. Um, and if we dig deeper into the social vulnerability index, it does overlook some of the facts, or it does consider some of the um, items that might not necessarily highlight a vulnerable population. And once we talk with professionals or we do understand each one of these items, it might not necessarily would highlight a vulnerable population such as vehicle ownership. In the most of the cases it does, but sometimes it does not. It's just an, an option or a choice of the person who live in the center city not to own a vehicle. But at the same time, as I mentioned, it is like the only data set that we did hold at that time in order to separate a vulnerable population from um, the more stable communities. Uh, which has its limitations, which um, the one that you just mentioned that we do have, it's, it's mostly would um, have urban versus rural areas. And uh, we saw the life animal crashes as one of the contributing factors and the good ones, not in the, in the better communities compared to the vulnerable communities, but it's not, it's not like holistic um, data set. Right now we do have some which could be incorporated in this research, some other, um, um, data sets such as the transportationally vulnerable or disadvantaged groups that is published um, from the census tracts themselves, which could explain a little bit more, uh, which was not an option by the time we did this research, but. Can you know. ask, can I suggest, suggest that you maybe stratify on a couple of other things that you look at socially vulnerable versus stable urban populations? 
right? Because you're trying to I figure see. out that, like, you're making a conclusion that it's a social vulnerability that's kind of being contributing to the differences, right? But it we just see that the vast majority of socially vulnerable communities are urban, and that's why they look different than the stable communities because most of those are in rural areas. So if you stratify by the level of urban density and then look at socially vulnerable like that, then you're then you're comparing more like apples to apples. I see. Or communities that kind of have the same built environments but more vulnerable in those ways. Yeah, for sure we can take this approach for future step of this research. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, I got it. <laughs> Project developments uh, at the DOT. I think that's very, you know, it's very, it could be very useful. Um, some of the differences you are showing, the, you know, the different conditions, uh, urban, suburban, uh, you know, the issues, uh, the, the need for the a better transportation system for different uh, urban, suburban areas. Uh, so, so the, my question would be. You know, the, you were in the conclusion, you were showing some s s a couple of alerts there. So my question is, you know, how would, how can, you know, the, the crash, you have identified, you know, so uh, in some neighborhoods, you know, the, uh, the crashes are due to certain, certain, certain types of crashes are happening in certain neighborhoods. Uh, so how, how, so do you have any comment on that, you know, how that can be for the uh, explode and can help the engineers to make decisions? I know it's a very general question, so but uh, if you can, please make comments on it. So, in terms of taking these findings into the implication side, one general um, SIP could be taken first of all before going specific to location and specific to. Um, specific problem or specific type of crash in a specific area from an equity aspect it, and general in general idea we can talk about the dollar amount of projects that are allocated for the different areas once we consider um, underserved communities or socially vulnerable communities um, sometimes um, most of the dollar amounts are, are uh, allocated for projects that might not consider improving the infrastructure in those areas, which could increase the crash rate, crash severity in those areas, which is one of inequity aspects that or inequity issues that we have in the current projects or the current project implementations. And looking at that in that aspect, it just highlights the importance of looking or consider equity on all the process from planning into design into implementation for the projects from the higher level into the smaller level throughout all the institutions that are included or has something to do with the transportation planning and transportation safety. Um, coming into the very specific uh, locations and the very specific um, issues into the areas, um, Looking at the different factors, it just can give um, an idea for the specific engineer or specific, specific committees who are try trying to solve that problem in that area, which make it a specific um, solution um, as an approach to, to promote safety from um, equitable aspect. So um, it takes the two different streams of being systematic or systemic in this area once we consider specific stuff versus once we look at the whole system and try to modify the whole process into it. Any other questions? All right, uh, thank you again, Rukaya, for sharing your research. Our final presentation of this session will be from Dr. Wenwen Zhang uh, on rider-centric approaches to micromobility safety. Dr. Zhang is an associate professor of public informatics at the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University. 
She received her PhD from Georgia Tech's School of City and Regional Planning in 2017. And she also earned her master's in city planning, civil engineering, and computational science and engineering from Georgia Tech as well. Previously, she was a research assistant at the Center for Spatial Planning, Analytics, and Visualization for six years. Before jo joining Rutgers, she worked for three years as, as an assistant professor of urban affairs and planning at Virginia Tech. Her research focuses on leveraging open, big data, data science techniques, and data visualization tools to address critical planning issues, especially on the impl implications of emerging transportation technologies, urban model urban energy modeling and the impact of the built environment on public health. Her dissertation explores the interactions between land use and transportation in the area of shared autonomous vehicles using an agent-based discrete event simulation. She has worked ex extensively in interdisciplinary environments to deliver techniques that can address real world sustainability problems. So with that, Dr. Zhang. Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to present about how uh, we adopt a rider-centric or traveler-centric approach to address the safety problem. Because, um, and just a warning, I don't have any machine learning model or shape place in my presentation, <laughs> um, but a lot of videos <laughs> there. Um, so here, uh, our project is a, um, just a small project within the micro, uh, make micro mobility safer and smarter at Rutgers University. Um, it's a project funded by NSF and the Federal Highway Association. Um, so uh, here we define micro mobility as not only e scooters and e bikes as you have in your mind, but also active travelers, uh, cyclists, and pedestrians. So here is just our team. And so just to, you know that it's not my own effort. We have a bigger team to support it. Um, and the research motivation behind it, as you can see, that although the active travel micro mobility is considered as more sustainable, um, but the adoption rate is still low. And uh, when we approach it, it's a lot of with um, the trouble there, the adoption rate low is because people have safety perception problems. They just feel unsafe to travel on road. So, and a lot of uh, uh, research so far has been conducted is using crash data, which is kind of after fact data. Um, so we are trying to adopt a more proactive approach to see whether we can adopt our traveler centric um, perspective to understand their subjective travel experience while traveling on road. So what, what to understand what factors actually make them feel unsafe um, and discomfort or and what factors actually cheer them up or make them exciting. And uh, here um, are the measures there with the improvement of technology. Traditionally, we have just the self-report surveys conducted after uh, the, the experiment to see, like, ask them directly how stressful you are after riding here or walking here, etc. But with the, the, the coming of more advanced biometric sensors technology, we now have uh, different sensors like heart rate trackers. We have galvanic skin response sensors. We also have eye tracking glasses to also help us to measure how stressful people are while walking and travel, um, cycling or e-scootering on the road. So this project, what we are trying to do is conduct semi-naturalistic -natural, uh, e-scooter experiments by wearing people up. So they are going to wear Toby eye tracking glass to understand where their eye uh, attention allocation has been on the road. And we're also asking them to wear stress sensors on the hand to see their skin conductivity level. We are also asking them to wear heart rate checker to see how their heartbeat changes. And on top of that, we also have a GoPro that comes uh, at the research stuff cycle um, bicycle who is traveling after the participant. We also have a mounted phone in front of uh, the traveler to capture both their face uh, expression as well as their front uh, what's the road condition before them so you can see that it's a lot of sensors loaded there um, on the experiment 
that. Yeah, sorry, I just went through all of it. And here is the design of the semi-naturalistic experiment. Um, so at first we designed this route starting at uh, on the Rutgers uh, College Avenue campus. And here you can see that the green part of the road segment is have protected bike lanes, dedicated bike lanes are uh, separated from the mixed uh, from the major traffic. And we also have painted bike lane here on the Hamilton Street. And then on the eastern and Wyckoff uh, um, uh, Street, we have the just mixed traffic. And we also have a segment in the park, uh, which have a trial there. Uh, at first, when we designed this um, route, we imagined that it has very road condition. And my hypothesis is that people is going to be most relaxed on the College Avenue and maybe also relaxed in the park because it has less traffic um, and so on and so forth. So that's my hypothesis. So we just did some one, um, several, um, uh, I would say, um, piloting experiment. So here's some data we collected uh, showing you stress level collected from the GSR sensor. Basically, um, human beings try to start to sweat a lot when they when they um, becoming more stressful, which change the skin conductivity level. And once translate to the um, sensor signal, you have uh, inflated GSR signal when you are stressful. So here is how it looks like uh, when this person has traveled along the road and the great part is um, the sensor failed <laughs> because of the sensor did got disconnected and here is the reason why it happened so here as i imagined the lowest stress level is on the dedicated bike lane as you may imagine their stress level is lower and it start to climb up and then once there is a near miss event happened here the stress level peaked a lot compared with um, just the regular travel and uh, once it goes to the park area, you can also see that it becomes yellow, meaning that the person is very stressful. This is actually because once we look into the data, the pavement in the area becomes so bad. And Hannah is actually the guinea pig there on the e-scooter. She's like, oh my God, I cannot believe I signed up for this. Um, I don't want to travel at all. And because it becomes so uneven, the, um, the, uh, the pavement, the sensor got disconnected actually. So you can see how bad the quality of pavement there and how much stress level it actually put on the traveler. Um, and ever since this experiment, we decided to revise our experiment route design to, to make it actually easier for the participant to navigate. Um, so here, uh, we since we captured a near-miss event here, and I just want to show you how powerful this rider-centric approach can shine lights in the perception of the safety on the road. So here is the situation. So the participant is trying to travel through this Eastern Avenue through this uh, yellow arrow we have. And at this intersection, uh, the main street that is perpendicular, um, perpendicular to the Eastern Avenue have stop signs. So suppose those um, blue car and the yellow car should yield to the e-scooter rider on the way. And what happened is that when, uh, when the participant approached this intersection, um, the driver from the yellow car made eye contact and confirmed that he, he is going to yield, but the blue car is just ignore the e-scooter and almost caused a near miss event. So here um, I'm going to show you how the situation actually works. So on the left hand side, it's the data collected from the eye tracker and you are going to see the red dot is where the participant's eyes has been focusing on. And on the right hand side, you have the travel trajectory and as well, uh, as, well as the GSR data, the stress level, the higher it is, the more stress for the person is. So here we go. So approach the intersection. And this person yielded, so she thought she can go, but this person didn't yield. And almost caused a near miss event, and the stress level just peaked during the event. So you can see that how this kind of interaction can make the person who is riding the e-scooter feel very unsafe during the process. Um, and while we're still collecting more e-scooter data, and uh, we have actually completed our working experiment uh, data collection process. So here's how our working experiment looked like. Uh, we asked 
participants to again wear those sensors to travel around the blasting school uh, and here's the round show up there it's about 1.2 miles uh, most people will complete it within 25 minutes uh, while working there and uh, we have post experiment surveys to ask them how they perceive how stressful working on different parts of the uh, this design the route um, and um, and also ask about their travel behavior demographic social economic status um, and after that um, we try to synchronize all the data we have to see whether the street infrastructure design will actually cause different stress level among different participants so oh. Sorry, it moved off. Um, but here are some um, just the preliminary result regarding the participants. So so far we have collected twenty four um, participants' data. Although it's a small sample, but it takes a lot of time to collect those kind of experiment data. And the gender distribution is very even. We have around twelve per female and uh, uh, around eleven male. And the age distribution is also uh, I would say quite robust because uh, we have. Um, we have like uh, mostly it's um, 18 to 25 because we our recruitment process is happening on campus, but we are not only limited to students, but um, also have a significant amount of people above 30, even 60. One person even traveled one hour down to our campus to help participate into the survey, which is very impressive. And here is the race distribution, mostly white and Asian. We are not successful recruiting any black population in this um, experiment, unfortunately. And here is the, this distribution fly off. <laughs> mostly it's actually centered at um, 1 p.m. after the lunch, and it's uh, a, a uh, like a bell curve distribution here ranging from 10 a.m. to uh, uh, 5 p.m. Um, so here, um, I'll just the first present some results we get from the survey. So we ask them after uh, uh, working along the route how stressful they are on different uh, road segments. And these are not participants' names, but street names. For example, George, Albany, <laughs> Joyce, Kilmer, Welton, Livingston, and Morris Avenue. But in general, you see that on George Street, they feel most relaxed because most people rate it as warm, less stressful. While it seems to be most stressful on Albany and Joyce, Kilmer, Avenue. Um, here, um, I'm going to show you how these streets look like. So George Street, if you're familiar with the area, is a walking only street. So they closed it to traffic during the pandemic to make space for the restaurants, for outdoor dining. And most people rate it as the least stressful because there is no car, because of the business, nice ambience, etc. You get the sense. But some people also notice that the temporary barriers are kind of confusing. And since they close the, down the traffic on George Street. The cross streets, cars tend to run the red lights because they know there is no car coming from the George Street, but it, it can uh, just to make uh, just makes them more uh, the pedestrian people like uh, more stressful while crossing those intersections. And sometimes during specific time of the day, it could be very clouded and people don't like the police presence on the street. Um, so now let's take a look at the places where they feel most stressful, Albany and Joyce Kilmer. Um, the only thing they like about those street is at certain parts, the sidewalk is very wide and they have train track make it like um, the long sight lines along the road, but mostly they feel it is most stressful because there are a lot of traffic, there is no green space and high police presence, and once they walk under the bridge, there are water dripping from it, and sometimes the trains will travel on the bridge making it very noisy, so I don't blame the participants that they feel the most stressful in those segments, and also plus the driver yelling at pedestrians sometimes. Okay, so let's take a look at our biometric sensors. So one uh, metric we are trying to evaluate is how, uh, the heart rate variability. So um, if you don't know uh, uh, this metric, it's basically a metric that is frequently used to measure the stress level. Um, basically, human beings, when they become more stressful, their heart tends to beep at more constant speed. Uh, and while you are more relaxed, it can kind of have a bit more variations in the heart rate. Well, 
well, a too low and a too high heart rate availability is an indicator you need to see a doctor. Mm -hmm. Something wrong with your heart. Um, but in general, this is a very good measure to see how stressful you are. So you can see that um, the HRV is the highest at George Street as what we would expect. And the lower it is, the more stressful they are. So they are also very stressful on Albany and Joyce um, Kilmer. So here, the Livingston and Morris also turned out to be like surprisingly low compared with other streets. Because as you may recall, the survey results doesn't typically actually say that these are stressful environment to travel to begin with. So I, we wonder whether it's just something wrong with the data we collected or it is actually consistent across different biometric sensors that we are looking at. Um, so we also look at the eye tracking data where we calculated the average fixation rate. So basically, the literature says the more stressful you are, the fixation duration will tend to be lower. So you tend to fixate on more objects while traveling, uh, while like pay more longer attention at specific objects while you are traveling. So here you can see it's almost consistent. So the Livingston and Morris Avenue, they also think it's um, show some like stress level of data there. And so are the GSR result, which is also a little bit higher on the Livingston and Morris Avenue. Um, so we take a closer look at those um, avenues and streets and realize that there is a very stressful intersection that they need to cross. So this is the intersection they need to cross from Livingston Avenue to the Morris Avenue. So Livingston Avenue is, uh, Livingston Street or Avenue, uh, is actually a four lane street. This intersection is not signalized. And sometimes depending on the traffic level, some people have to wait a long, long period of time before um, the vehicle will yield to them to, uh, to cross the street, which makes it very stressful for uh, some of the participants. And due to the way we design our surveys, we ask each participant to rate each road segment how stressful they are. Um, but um, because it's an intersection. So some people allocate this stressful event towards Morris. Some people allocate it towards Livingston, making it looks like these streets are not very stressful because the the comments get diverted into two streets. So this also reveals some um, uh, survey design problems we have in the first place. So we are also re revising our surveys for the e-scooter and the cycling studies. Um, and this also reminds me that maybe VJ's um, uh, the D, uh, NJDOT's mid-block um, intersection cross improvement could benef benefit a lot here, right? Um, so, um, and here uh, we noticed that by comparing different sensors, GSR is so far the, mo the sensor that captures the stress level in almost real-time manner compared with other sensors. Uh, heart rate variability and eye trackers tends to be have uh, moves in a slower speed compared with the GSR. So here is another video showing you one of the participants try to turn and uh, make a turn here. But before he make a turn, there is something surprising happened on the street and make his stress level peak to do after the event. So he's trying and this moped just coming with out like coming out of from nowhere and just startle the pedestrian. And in the survey, he also mentioned coding his own words, the jackass who is right, <laughs> uh, riding on the sidewalk is, um, is, uh, is very annoying and he feels angry afterwards. However, um, we also need to notice that GSR not only captures negative feelings like stressful events, but also captures positive feelings as well. Because in general, it just captures emotional arousal. It can be excitement. It can be stressful events as well. So here is another data that we collected during our piloting experiment. So um, our student, PhD student, is working along the route until we, we see the PhD director. OK? so and and here is how the GSR responds. So the PhD director, Bob Nolan, our very dearest Bob is working up and now she noticed. And now you can see the GSR levels start to go up. And based on the participant claims that it's a positive feeling rather than stress. So I will just believe it. Um, and ever since this, Bob is like, I need to spook all my PhD students to see how they could re uh, respond to my presence. 
But um, in addition to this, we're trying to understand the navigation patterns as well using the data we have, which is um, marriage the deep learning algorithm with the video we have captured using the Toby eye tracking glass. So we automatically segment the image into over 40 categories. We're trying to understand what objects people are paying attention to while navigating the streets. So here are just some preliminary results. On different streets, the attention allocation tend to vary and also tend to vary across different participants, even on the same street. For some street, you can see that people uh, um, tend to focus on more on buildings, while others tend to focus more on the sidewalks, etc. depending on the pavement condition. So we're still um, conducting more rigorous uh, data analysis to see how, uh, if there is any patterns in terms of um, attention allocation on different streets. And our next step is to still collect more data sample. And here is advertisement if you have time and interested in participating in our experiment to come up to Rutgers New, New Brunswick campus. You can actually get, no, we increased the incentive to $30 <laughs> Amazon <laughs> gift card um, to participate into our 30 minute cycle, um, bicycle ride or e-scooter ride. And if you participate both, you can get a $60 <laughs> Amazon gift card. Um, well, wearing those sensors to travel along predefined routes and um, we can collect more data on how people perceive the environment. We are also trying to conduct more um, data analysis on the working uh, pedestrian activity data, uh, experiment data we have collected and hopefully next year I will come back with more rigorous like consistent statistical results to tell you what people are looking at while traveling on urban area and how that correlates or not correlates with this stress level while traveling it. Okay, that's all about it. Thank you. Um, have you considered increasing your study area to go on to Bush campus? Because I understand there is a dedicated walk slash bike way to go from College Avenue to Bush. Uh, and then also understand the, um, the interactions at the terminus of that bicycle dedicated path or the bicycle lane or the bicycle bridge to Bush campus and how that interaction affects not just the stress levels, but also the, um, the continuity of that route. Um, thank you for your suggestion. And first of all, personally speaking, I would definitely want to do more experiments to understand things if let me see how many NJDOT people is here. If NJDOT support us to some extent, <laughs> are we? Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, and the other thing, uh, just to, uh, to let you know, like uh, to do this kind of experiment, we need very rigorous IRB as well as risk management team involved at Rutgers. So, um, uh, uh, yes and no. They could say all oh, this could be too dangerous for people to travel. So I don't want you to do this kind of experiment. Or they may say, yes, you can go ahead and do it. Um, so it really depends on the IRB approval and et cetera. And given the continuity question on the bicycle lane is that, um, so in the um, this route that we designed for the, um, for our e-scooter, it's also the route that we're going to adopt for our cycling experiment is that, as though there is dedicated bike lane here, it's just stopped abruptly and actually making it a very hard right turn here. Although the initial way we designed it is that we want to make as much right turn as possible to minimize the traffic exposure. But in this case, the bike lane is located on the left hand side of the road. So almost everybody have to get off the bike and just to cross that intersection. So once we collect more data, that will be very interesting to see that we have such a nice dedicated bike lane here. But by the end, it's nobody wants to use it because they have to make this right turn here. Um, will be very interesting to see as well. Yeah, Ali. Hi, 
this is such interesting work. And I love how you combine the different types of data collection with survey and eye tracking and GoPros and biometric. And biometric stuff is not easy to collect <laughs> or analyze. Um, my question is, so do you, I could see why, now that you were just giving that answer, I could see why you'd want to send everybody the same way so everybody's making the same turns. But I wonder if you send everybody in the experiment the same way, how you can tease apart that everybody felt the most comfortable at the end compared with everybody just got used to riding on the scooter and felt better towards the end of the drive. So it wasn't like George Street. It was just like after a while, even those, especially those um, who aren't used to driving on, you know, micro mobility scooters felt more comfortable there than at the beginning. For, for the pedestrian one, we only asked them to walk one time. But for this, um, uh, the e-scooter the e and the cyclist one, we actually asked them to travel twice. And the first one will serve as a baseline. So that is a, uh, we do see that sometimes people, while walking, they, when they walk to an uh, unfamiliar environment, their stress level will also go a little bit higher um, compared, no matter how safe that road looks like. So that's something we also want to control in this experiment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just uh, one quick question. Um, what are the sp speed limits on those uh, your test route? Is that uh, 25 miles per hour or is it more than that? Uh, it depends on the section mostly. I believe it's um, 25 ish. Um, and I don't think they are allowed to travel beyond that. But given that the evidence we can provide has to be edited down, so decide whether they want to go on sidewalk or not. And sometimes, um, for example, Uh, okay, so this is another follow up question. Is there an age limit to sign up for you, sir? You know, help you with the survey? <laughs> Uh, so in terms of um, participating into our experiments, first, there are several constraints. Uh, first, <laughs> uh, I don't think you raised any red flag there. So uh, first, you, you, you need to be uh, travel comfortably without glass, or you can travel comfortably with eye contact lenses so that you can wear the glass, eye tracking glass, and track the uh, check your eye movement. And the second, you also uh, cannot have um, certain kind of disease, like you, you will faint if there is light, uh, like uh, those kind of disease, and you need health insurance to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so you are, and you need to sign a waiver that, that you are not going to blame ruggers for, for putting you on this kind of thing. Um, and, um, and also you cannot wear any health electric device because the, the gel SR signal probably will intervene with those devices, like for example, pay, hard pacer, or those kind of things. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all the limitations I have on board. And uh, and you cannot work for ruggers to be on e-scooter because ruggers risk management said no employer is allowed on scooter while they are allowed on bicycle. Yeah. Re really good work. A uh, question is this, like in the consent form, do you ask them, do they have experience in driving the e-scooter before they come to the ex experiment? And do you diversify that part or categorize that thing that if they had or they did not have the experiment? Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question, too. So again, go back to our IRB application process. Um, so far, we're only hiring people uh, who is um, familiar with cycling, comfortable with cycling and riding e-scooters. And before the experiment, somebody is going to evaluate your skills. So claiming that you are good at it is not good enough. We're <laughs> trying to make sure you're actually comfortable uh, riding those um, uh, vehicles um, before you we, we put you on road. Yeah. 
yeah. Um, so, um, and there are studies not here in United States, but um, in European world where they put people under more controlled environment, especially use um, to understand how their attention allocation will actually differ from more experienced ones. That's also very interesting to develop educational materials. Yeah. The train. Oh yeah. Um. So it's a working experiment, right? Um. So um. Here the train. Um. So mostly the train will interfere here and here. So it's like the bridge where the train will travel on top of it. And um, participants do report their stress level goes significantly up if while they walk under the bridge, the train travels above the bridge. Oh, the steepness. The slope. Slope. Sorry. Um, the steepness. It's. I think mostly flat, but still we um it's mostly interferes with our GSR data because it's trying to measure your your how much you are sweating like so um, you can imagine towards the end the the GSR level always go up because the more you work the more sweat you produce right um so we have an algorithm to tease out that component from the GSR and just to get the the FISC to what do they call the FISC to which is more um, considered as removing the effect of the movement out of it so slope. Um, if they are climbing hills, will influence the GSR readings. Um, but um, in our sense, we don't have that much um, variation. And similar is the, I believe, the e-scooter route, et cetera. Yeah. Do you think that um, testing like high visibility clothing or high visibility like blinking lights on scooters might be an interesting iteration? Yeah, so again, tied up back to our TRV, we're actually going to ask them to wear protective clothes while traveling. That's part of the IRB process. Um, but yeah, it is, and they also will be equipped with those um, bicycle lights uh, when they travel. So it could be influencing the results if it's different, um, is if it influences how other road users response to them. The other question related to it I, I get a lot is whether your participants is going to influence by wearing all those sensors. Um, we find in the working study is that I feel some people will have elevated um, stress level if we put them to work on specific route, but it doesn't, since we're capturing the variation in the stress level, so I think in general we are okay. Um, but And also the equipment that we're asking them to wear is not like stand out as like something that is very different from a, a, a normal glass. And most of the sensor you cannot even see. The heart rate tracker is just this watch, very similar to the Garmin watch that they are wearing. So yeah. Um, it's mostly constrained by RV in terms of what we can do. We also want to ask them to see how, what is the influence on multitasking, like asking them to reply to a phone call, et cetera. But I would imagine IRB will say no to this. <laughs> Don't text while, while, while riding bikes or uh, et cetera. Yeah. Are there any different data sets that you can get in the future, like people's Apple Watches and their GPS or something like that? I was just fascinated by it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so currently the heart rate tracker we're using the, is the Garmin watch. It actually performed, we did the experiment with both Apple Watch and a Garmin watch. Uh, just the advertisement for Garmin watch. Everybody who wants to wear a smart watch, wear Garmin instead of Apple. Um, it's more accurate in terms of uh, collecting the heart rate data and the GPS signals. Um, yeah, so just a something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, thank you, Dr. Zhang, and thank you to all of our presenters today. This is the end of our safety breakout session. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the uh, 25th annual NJDOT Research Showcase, and have a good afternoon, everyone.